earlier segment, we saw how the overcurrent relay is commonly used for protection of distribution feeders. However, on high voltage transmission lines, the preferred method of protection is usually through the application of distance relays or impedance relays as they are often called. Why? Well, distance relays are faster, more selective, as selectivity is obtained on the basis of voltage changes as well as current. Easier to coordinate because they are not affected as much by short circuit magnitude and hence changes in generating capacity and system configuration. The device number for the distance relay is number 21. The earlier types of distance relays worked on the balanced beam principle like this, and certainly this is the easiest way for us to study the concept. The beam is pivoted like a seesaw with voltage and current coils at opposing ends. The voltage coil is fed from the voltage transformer on the line, or more usually on the bus feeding the line, while the current coil is fed from the current transformer on the protected line. Under normal operating conditions, the voltage coil's attractive force is far stronger than that of the current coil, hence the balance beam stays in this position. However, if a fault occurs on the line, then the magnitude of current increases greatly, with the result that the current coil now produces much greater attractive force and will overcome the restraint of the voltage coil. The balance beam seesaws in the opposite direction and closes the contacts in the tripping circuit, so tripping the line circuit breaker. The actual point of tripping could be set by adjusting the position of the center pivot, or more simply, by adjusting taps on the voltage and current coils to increase or decrease the number of turns. Either way, the actual point of tripping depends upon the comparison that is the ratio of voltage to current V over I. The relay is in fact measuring the impedance of the circuit being protected, including the load impedance. However, if we have a fault on the line, say a direct phase to phase fault, then the circuit impedance to the fault is only that of the conductors themselves, and as we know, this is a relatively small value. Indeed, this is the very reason that the current increases to such a high magnitude. So the relay is set to operate when the measured impedance falls below a specific value. If we know the impedance per mile of the line conductors, we can set the impedance relay to trip for faults within any particular distance from the relay. For example, let's say this line is 125 miles long and the total impedance is, say, 100 ohms. At the halfway point, the impedance will be 50 ohms, at three-quarter length, 75 ohms, and so on. The relay will be installed at this substation close to the breaker, but it can be adjusted to reach out as far along the line as we wish. Typically, it will be set to protect up to 90% of the length of the line, that is, for an impedance of 90 ohms in this example. Why? Well, relays have a 10% error margin, and we don't want the relay to overreach. The relay is using secondary values from the CTs and VTs, so it really measures secondary impedance. The relay continuously compares voltage and current and if the primary impedance falls below 90 ohms, it will trip its associated breaker. However, if a fault occurs beyond this line, the impedance will be higher than 90 ohms, and the relay will not trip. So, the relay is giving us the desired selectivity. Usually, a second element is installed to protect the remainder of the line and reach out into the second zone. A third element may be added to reach even further and so provide backup protection for the first and second zones. In each case, a timer is added so as to delay operation of the second and third elements in order to allow the primary protection to operate in those zones. 
It is important to note that we are talking about the impedance that is measured by the relay, not the resistance. Obviously, this is because the conductors contain both resistance and reactance. Typically, the conductors in this 125 mile long transmission line will contain a resistance of, say, 50 ohms and reactance of 86.6 ohms. Let's plot this on an impedance diagram. Resistance is shown along the horizontal reference vector and inductive reactance is shown on the vertical axis. Capacitive reactance, if present, would be shown on the negative vertical axis. In this example, we will assume that the quoted 86.6 ohms reactance has taken into account both inductive and capacitive reactance. Plotting resistance and reactance, we find that the total impedance comes to 100 ohms and it is at an angle of 60 degrees from the reference vector. If we were to set our relay to protect, say, 90% of this line, then the operating point would be here, at 90 ohms. The relay would operate for any impedance along this line between 0 and 90. But that's not all. With the simple balanced beam type relay, it would operate for anywhere within this circle where 90 ohms is the radius. The balanced beam does not take into account phase angle or direction of current flow. It will trip as long as the measured impedance falls below 90 ohms. In fact, it would trip for a fault upstream, that is, on the bus or on the line feeding the bus. Look, even though current through the CT is reversed, the relay still responds to high current in relation to voltage. That is, it sees a low impedance. On the circle diagram, this operating point would be out here, in the third quadrant. To avoid this problem, directional relays, device number 32, are usually combined with balanced beam relays in order to restrict operation to faults downstream of the relay. So this first quadrant is the part of the circle diagram which interests us. We can add to the same diagram the operating circle for the second zone and another for the third zone protection that we mentioned. In each case, the relay element will pick up if impedance falls within its respective circle. For example, a fault out here in the second zone may cause impedance to fall to, say, 140 ohms, which is less than the second element set point of 160 ohms. The relay will operate, and after its timer has timed out, the breaker will trip. But we have not yet considered the impedance of the load. Where does this fit into the picture? Let's take an example. Here we have our same 132 kilovolt line feeding a 90 MVA load on the B bus. That is 76 kV line to neutral and 30 MVA per phase. This gives us a line current of almost 400 amps. Dividing current into voltage, we get 76,000 volts divided by 400 amps equals 190 ohms. This is the impedance of the load. Let's say the load is operating at a power factor of 0.9, that is about 25 degrees lagging. The load impedance can be shown off bus B on the circle diagram like this. But the relay measures the total impedance, that is the load plus line conductors. So we must add these values vectorially on our circle diagram. We see now that the measured impedance is well outside of the first zone of protection but it is not far outside of the third zone. So the relay will not operate, and the condition appears to be satisfactory. But on large transmission systems, we often experience load swings. During such a surge, an increase in current could be seen by the relay as a decrease in load impedance, and it may well fall within the third zone of protection. If the surge remained for several seconds, it would cause tripping of the first breaker. Do not forget that our relay for first, second, and third zones is located on bus A.
The same thing would happen, of course, if the total load was increased from, say, 90 to 160 MVA. In this case, the impedance may even fall below the setting of the third zone and cause tripping. It is important to remember that where the distance relay is concerned, some consideration must be given to the load characteristics as well as the impedance of the line. Because of these limitations, the balanced beam relay has been superseded by improved types of distance relay, and we'll be looking at these in the next segment. For now, it's time for a break. Please switch off the tape now and go through this material in your workbooks. Thank you.